Hello everyone, welcome to uh, the Using Docker Track. Um, this is our, our last session for today. Uh, looks like looks like everyone's found a seat. If not, there's, there's plenty up front right here. Um, I'd like to introduce Michelle Laura Bustamante uh, from Saliant. Uh, she's a Docker captain, she's a security architect, uh, and she'll be speaking on message-based microservices architectures uh, driven by Docker, so. Thank you. And <laughs> thank you. Okay. And he just said the magic word. There's a party after, but I'm the last session and I can go as long as I want. <laughs> Some of you aren't laughing. What's up with that? Okay. So, right. So I'm Michelle. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, I do uh, a number of different things. My company, Saliance, I run a security and microservices practice. Uh, those are actually separate practice, but they co-mingle quite a bit. Um, we build a lot of solutions for enterprises from the design through production, you know, story all the way through on Amazon, Azure, on-prem, and hybrid. And the reason I tell you that is because what I have noticed, and we all have noticed, the team, is that there seems to be a common thread, which is, you know, companies are more and more embracing this whole idea of message-based architectures for many reasons. And some of those reasons are the things that I want to talk about in this session. Um, and I'm kind of excited about that because even though it is work, so yes, there is work involved, um, I do find that there are a lot of benefits on the other side. So I'm just hoping to inspire you to think about this architecture, understand why we like it, understand certainly some of the challenges, which we'll touch on at the end, um, but understand how we go about making that a productive development cycle as well. So I'm gonna start with you know, just an overview, and then we're gonna get into design thinking, and then we're gonna get into the reasoning about the events and messages, followed by a demo where I'll talk about local and then to production, and how that might look in one technology stack, because obviously we could do this with different technology stacks, right? So with that being said, um, let's start with what we do today with applications. Just out of the gate, right, we build, let's say, web apps, many different browsers, responsive apps. We have back-end server apps or spa applications. We have mobile apps that talk to APIs. We have back-ends for those mobile apps, hopefully separate, just because. Uh, we have shared APIs that might be used. We have third-party APIs that might need API management. And then we've got a back-end and maybe some back-end processing. So this is hello world today. Um, and with that, you know, we're already dealing with what I would call a distributed hello world. Not an app doesn't do many things that you're seeing here. And it's also our monolith today, because a lot of these end up with crossover related code. We're afraid to hit the button and update one piece because it might affect another. And we also have typically a shared backend. So this is today's problem space. And therefore, I guess my point is that it's already complicated, right? We're already dealing with a lot of things out of the gate, understanding distributed systems. And so adding microservices, while well, it does add more of those things, and yes, there are additional complexities, it also brings tooling and operational procedures and practices that try to help us with doing that better. And so, you know, the, the principles of microservices help us to surmise, you know, how would we manage more of those things while we're already dealing with distribution. Now, in addition, microservices leads us toward a model whereby services truly own their own data backend. And these silos are created so that we can deploy, you know, seamlessly pieces of the application and client without touching other parts of the system. That is the mission. It is all of our mission if we embrace this architecture, just microservices itself, right? And there is a liberty that comes with that because now the business can hopefully benefit because all they really want is more features more frequently all over the place. And they're afraid to do it because of the regression testing and problems. So we can maybe get a little better at that with these better operational procedures and these better tooling and practices. And so ultimately, what we're giving them is that story, right? An improvement to that story. And hopefully, not such a fear to hit the button and deploy updates, which is our goal. So we're looking for better practices. We're looking for visibility in production. We'd like to know when things are going wrong. We'd like to understand what happened, which means we need instrumentation, we need logs, and arguably messages can play a role in that as well. On the business level, for example, what's been going on, what activity is taking place. So with that, 
you know, what we're looking for really is benefit to the business. All of these things we've done, including operational procedure improvements, more reliability with deployment, better uh, release cycles so that they can be more rapid and co-evolve features across your solution, helps the business. And then everybody's happy. They dance, maybe not quite that well. So we haven't yet, though, solved in this discussion the distributed data problem. So great, we have these silos, these services that own their back end and their data, but we still need to deal with the fact that data is going to be distributed. And it's going to be even more because there's more microservices. So let's talk about the history of that, right? If you think about SOA, yes, I said that word. Um, enterprise architects' view of that was kind of a little bit easier to work with back in the day because they would look at it like a whole solution, an ERP, owned its own data, had its own services behind that, that that protected access to the data. CRMs would do the same, CMSs would do the same, and they'd integrate these things with these, you know, BizTalk servers or other related things. And the story of data ownership, well-defined service boundaries in front of that data was kind of clear to the enterprise architect's view because, of course, how else am I going to get back end data from these systems that are closed. And the answer to that is, well, when their interface sucks, sometimes you just did it anyway, and you built your own data sync so that you could make that data work for you, and maybe even sometimes do it two ways with great pain. But the point of this really is that, you know, at least from an enterprise architect's view, most of the time, kind of, sometimes it worked. But when we went to what I call little SOA from the big architect, enterprise architect SOA, building our apps. We're developers. I have, you know, customers and orders and other things in my system. And I want to build these beautiful SOA-friendly service boundaries that own the data. You cannot, you shall not touch the data unless you go in through that service interface. That's the rule. That's the law. And I want to do this. I really want to do this. And we fought through this all through the 2000s. But we ended up with relations. And that relational data was unfortunately um, difficult to get away from, right? Because customers have orders. I need to do queries. They need to be efficient. It has to work. So we did what we had to do, and we felt very bad about it um, because this, right? So enter data services. Data services gave us the solution to this problem absolutely and completely because all you had to do was query across many data services, aggregate the result, put it into your app, and it would perform like stink. Literally. Um, so maybe not such a good idea. So instead, we accepted our transgressions and said, you know what, let's just stick with the queries on the back end. And we'll make a well-defined service interface that at least defines the way we're using the data, if not protecting access to the store. I tell you this story because this resonates still today with microservices, right? We have to still deal with, and even more so, this distributed data problem. And there isn't one magical solution to that problem, right? I mean, clearly there are going to be areas in the system that work, you know, with that and work with, and others that do not work with it. Some that absolutely require asset transactions and others that can live with eventual consistency. So solving the problem is not going to be a snap, but there are different ways. Two-phase commit, albeit difficult over services, things like compensating operations, and then, of course, eventual consistency could be one model. And there are many ways to do that model, right? Um, so what I want to focus on is just the eventual consistency story. Let's just say it together. Embrace eventual consistency. Or we don't have to say it together. I just said it. We're done. And the thing that I'm trying to get across is that, you know, when we think about eventual consistency, when we say, yep, I'm okay with looking at that, what does that mean? It means a couple of things, maybe more than a couple, but I'll talk about two. And that is services that own data eventually may need to share some of that change with some other service, right? Because the data is somehow related. Um, um, sometimes that involves a sequence of events, which means we might even need things like sagas. I'm not going to get into that. But, you know, it can be that there are these patterns that help us solve those problems, too. In the meantime, just looking at it, you know, from a high level, eventual consistency does mean I need a way to get that fact that data changed, let's call it, to another place. So that's the thing. Um, when we look at aggregation, it's the same problem. I need new views into the same data. How do I achieve that? I do that by 
projecting somehow, again, the fact that something happened gets replayed elsewhere, right? I could do this even from a back end, you know, just with data triggers, but the problem with that is you don't really have visibility at the business tier that all these things happened, and that's kind of important too. So that's why we like events. Now, an interesting thing happens when you decide eventual consistency could work, and it may not work everywhere. Let's just take the opportunity to say it could work. And let's just free our mind of the idea that data might be related across these business domains. I'm now able to design without the constraint of all those problems, because guess what happens when you're doing design and you think, oh, but that's related to that. How are we gonna do this? It's a mess. And it's really impossible to get through design and make decisions when you're worried about the other side. You have to think about first the domains. And that's what microservices principles and guidance teach us, is that you go first to the, the solution, the enterprise, whatever it is you're trying to co-evolve or change or migrate, uh, you wanna break the monolith, and you take a new look at the domains, right? Those domains could be like this with customer and product and shopping carts, could be other things in your business. A common thing that we all face is identity, right? Logging in, we all know it. So I'm gonna use that as my example. But the point is, even these domains, while they might look like owned domains, and look, I've locked it, this is my blueprint, even each of those, I bet you, could have different business consumers, which means I might look at orders three, five, 10 different ways across the company that need different types of reporting, different types of UI, different types of management cycles and feature cycles. And that's what they mean when they say, break the monolith, look at your domain-driven design, and try to figure out your business capabilities. It's about how your business people interact with the, you know, the customer, and therefore the back end. So given that, just tiny bit of theory, let's open up identity as an example. And I'm gonna take you through this because I'm gonna be demoing an example that does this, and I want you to have context. So when we think about identity management, we think about login, first of all. So I log in, I have protocols, right? That's one piece of the puzzle. I have user management. I need to create users, activate, deactivate, et cetera. I have user self-service. I need to register, self-register, confirm my email, forget my password, reset that. Things that hopefully don't involve others. Um, user permissions is another area, but that starts to feel like, hey, I could carve that off. What if we're managing permissions for all of you across 200 applications? Shouldn't that be its own thing? Probably, so let's just color that different. And then profile, if you have rich features for customers, you have like literally 200,000, 2 million, 20 million customers with lots of applications and management and accounts and multi-tenancy, this could be a thing. It's a separate domain. Or it could just be its first name and last name in an email, in which case, boom, that could be just part of identity. So we have to think about those things. This might look like I have user domain, a permissions domain, and a user profile domain or a profile, but I could open up uh, or I could bring in profile and say, let's make that part of user self-service because all we need is a first and last. Let's just keep it there. That simplifies one thing. And then permissions, we'll just call it a separate area. So I'm gonna focus on this domain, which might now look like that's one microservice. Maybe it's one domain. User, is it one domain? I don't know. I guess it depends on other things, right? Scale, usage patterns, feature delivery, business capabilities around identity. So let's open that up. I have an identity server system. That's an open source product that we frequently implement. And it has a back end for configuration and users. Simple, right? I have two services, a config service and a user service. So maybe then I add configuration website for managing all the applications. So we go ahead and we add that UI and we call the same service. Same backend, right? One's reading, one's updating. Um, I've got a user management UI for, for adding users, creating users, activating users. I've got a self-service UI for register myself and reset my password. Maybe they all live in one website, right? I don't know yet. But the point is, right now I have two back-end domains anyways, two microservices, if you will. Now, when we think about how this might evolve, and this is where suddenly we start thinking about how do we deal with domains and messages and all of that good stuff, is 
I really might need to look at, you know, management of 200 applications with some, you know, separate set of features. So maybe I just start by saying, let's have a separate API, at least for management, from runtime. Because runtime's just, go get it, and we're done. It's one call. And then on the other side with users, same thing. Login is just login. User management has a surface area. User self-service has a surface area. So I break these up into separate sets of functions, and that way I at least have the surface area defined, even though right now I still have two domains, right? I'm still with the same back end. It's gonna be limited to scale based on that back end. And I haven't yet really broken this into more microservices, just at least separate contracts, right? Contracts that could live in one service or many. And so let's continue and say my goal is to get here. And then our question is why? Why do we want to separate these and have each of those contracts own its own back end? What's the purpose? What would be the reason? And here is where we go down the road of it depends. But I've seen this done in 20 different ways with exactly this service, right? One is where we need to optimize reads because we literally have 20 million users, right? And they're gonna be concurrent access, heavy 9 a.m. through 10 because everybody gets to the office. And that's the first app they open. You know, that's definitely a reason to optimize. Another would be configuration controls. We manage 200 apps, we have 20 different divisions across the organization. We need to control how they create application connections to identity because they'll mess it up for sure if we don't control that. So we're constantly rolling out features to control that and we don't want that to mess up our runtime because that's got 20 million users. Don't mess that up, right? Update that over here. We'll eventually have the app available. Next thing would be multi-tenant asks. I manage users, but I've got, you know, 20 million users across 5,000 tenants. They each want features. I gotta roll out new features. I gotta give them ways to manage this stuff. There's additional features on the side. It's different data. It's a different feature cycle. It's different business capability. So we separate these things, and another would be reduced support. We're constantly updating how you self-serve so that you don't call support because that costs money. So giving you some sense of ideas, I promise I'm done with the theory almost, but I want to impress upon you that this takes a little thinking. And once you get down to this point, and you've unlocked that we understand what data goes behind each of those services, now we can start really talking about where does eventual consistency live and what do we do with it. So with that, let's think. I have all those services I just talked about, right? Let's say I want to add an app or remove an app from config. What would that do? Well, it would probably need to update the config runtime. So we do that. How do we get it there? Again, eventual consistency, possibly with events, because that's what I'm talking about in this session. Um, Another thing we might do is register a user, which needs to update user management so that we have the user available in the management tool to help them if something goes wrong. Then we have confirmed their email, which now creates a user in the runtime because they now have an email and a password and all those other things. And then we have things like deactivate a user, and that needs to update both maybe my user self-service and my runtime. You get the idea. You can literally take for each of those services the 20 some messages did I say 20 some? Think about it. Microservice immediately makes it kind of manageable, doesn't it? Can I go through 20 use cases in the service domain that I care about and make sure that each of those events that happen have a clear path to what else could be affected? Possibly, right? Because now I'm not thinking about the monolith all at once. I'm thinking about this domain, nice and clear. I make it sound so easy, right? Um, so the user gets locked out, same thing. That might or might not touch anything else because usually that self resets after five minutes. So now we talk about messages. I've now thought about activity that could happen at each of those services. What's the next thing? And the next thing is our you know, mechanism for sending the fact that those events happened. And again, the focus of this talk being messages, we're gonna treat those like events. An event is a fact, it's a thing that happened in the past, it carries all the data it needs to show you what happened in the past, and therefore it is actually the source of record, really, of what's going on in the system. It is eventually consistent when it is played through your event backbone, 
into those back-end stores through what I would call a projector. It could be a consumer. There's various names for it. But you're projecting data out of your event backbone, right? And the idea is that those messages issued by each of those services are owned wholly by those services. You never replay the same message from a different service. They have names for a reason. So there's an easy way to isolate all this stuff and have those projectors pull and write to their respective store. But we're not done yet, because even though these are individual services that own their own data and now have their own messages that indicate the data changes, and have their own projector, which sends the data to the data store, um, you know, I still need to play through what does this mean to my architecture. So now we talk about you know, config, for example. It could be a CQRS model, right? Whereby I'm writing the message that the app was added or removed, but I don't really need a separate data store over there. How about the projector just updates the runtime store, right? So I have a read side that's optimized, and I have a write side that's dealing with you know, the events that happen and the updates. On the other side, though, it starts to get interesting because user registered, well, that should probably also update users because I need to store it there. So now we look at things like CQRS views which is a pattern that allows you to obviously consume messages that might go in different topics and pull those in for your view because it matters to you. I still own that message over at the user self-service because it's the only place it'll ever be issued, but it doesn't mean that I can't create new views from multiple views of messages that come through. And there's a few ways to do that, either by going to the topic itself or having a more global topic for across each of the identity things. And I'll just continue quickly then, email confirmed would also then create a user, so now we're affecting also, you know, password reset, user activate, all different messages carrying one piece of data of what happened that then becomes data in the back end. Um, and likewise with locked out or deactivate user, these would update whatever store needed. So CQRS views would be a way to achieve that. Now, all that's still theory, but it's important theory hopefully, to take you through the process. How do I think about this, and how do I get to a point where I'm ready to code? I'm almost ready to code, I swear. One more thing. So when I have all these messages in my backbone that is being projected to each of the microservice verticals, I also have a powerful thing, which is the history of all of those messages and things that I can do later or now if I thought about it in advance. So I could, for example, say, look, how do I build a history table? Let's write some code. No. So I'm sure there's a few people that have probably written a, a history table by going into the actual code and making sure that you write to two tables, right? So that you have a transaction log of all the user things. I was created on this day. I was registered on this day. You know, my permissions were updated on this day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I now have a built-in audit. These messages are super powerful. You don't have to know in advance even how you want to audit because you can replay the messages from the beginning of time if you want. I mean, beginning of time is a long time, but, you know, theoretically. Um, so I can take those messages, and again, CQRS view style, pull them from either a global topic or otherwise, and project those out and build things like history out of the box. So how sweet is that, right? You're never gonna write your applications the same as you do today again. Silence is acceptance. So from design to the technology stack, I have this design, now how do I build it? And if I'm doing this in Amazon, I might do it different than in Azure. If I'm doing it on-prem, I might look at tools that work on-prem and cloud and make them the same. So there's lots of ways. We've done it with Kafka, Kinesis, and Event Hub, for example. But let's just say I'm gonna focus on the Azure stack right now. So I'm gonna basically deploy, using obviously containers, my microservices. So my microservices will be my Docker containers. That's my web apps, that's my APIs, that's my projectors. Those are all containers that I can manage, deploy, and deal with on whatever level I need to in terms of which ones go together, right, as part of a microservices deployment story. And then I'm gonna do like a Docker stack deploy. So I'm gonna use uh, Docker Enterprise for this demo. Again, there are different stacks that you can use, different container orchestration platforms. I can use this with Swarm or Kubernetes as well. So that'll be my demo in there. 
And I'm going to use Redis for caching because we need caching and availability for, you know, clustered services, right? Uh, data protection and so on. Um, I'm going to use App Insights for my logs in the cloud because that's native to Azure, so that makes sense. And I'm going to use Event Hub for my event backbone because that gives me interesting things that I want to leverage for this whole event story, like capture. I'll get back to that. And then I've got SQL and Cosmos for a combination of relational or not. And something that's little known about SQL database is that, you know, if you have a single server and then you build up all of these different tables in a database, you can let Azure scale it out for you. So as long as you have sort of that sense of ownership, which tables and data, you know, go together with this microservice, you can still let microservice give you the infrastructure that's shared and still get your microservice story there. So that's the technology stack in the cloud. But here's the thing, I haven't done my dev yet. So now what? Should I go into the cloud and create a dev environment maybe? Get an event hub there, share it with all of you so you can stomp on my messages? Have a database that's not clean and we don't know this data, so I gotta create all new data? Do stuff like that? Or could I just make a local technology stack with Docker? And we do this all the time. And you know what? It's worth the investment every second. And that's because I can now do a compose up and send a message to all of you if I wanted, git pull, compose up, and you can build the whole backbone. And it can include, you know, the containers that we need in our whole solution to run. And then you can decide to debug the one you care about. It can run, you know, your Redis back end in the local environment, elk for logging, because then it's in a container and I don't have to install anything like seek. Um, I can have my Kafka locally, so I have a real messaging engine to work with. And I can have PG Admin and Postgres to do my data work, and including Martin to do the NoSQL. Now, this is just one way to do it. Choose others, that's fine. The point is, all the time. Once you've invested in doing this, you will never go back. So I can't emphasize that enough. And with that, now I can, you know, show code. And, you know, we're still well ahead of schedule. So what I'm going to do is start by giving you a, a taste of uh, kind of what we've got going over here. And I am going to run. So let's take a look at my scripts. You know, again, we're not going to go through every single one of these, but you'll be able to uh, see those later. Um, the point is we build these scripts that will start up the backend Postgres that will recreate just the backend, because right now I'm doing my development. What I want is backend up, Visual Studio, let's write code, and let's hit the backend, yeah? Eventually I'll do compose up all things. So I'm gonna do that, and when we do this rebuild, what we're basically doing is, you know, building up, oops, I meant to go over here, uh, things like I have a, a YAML file for Postgres and it's gonna pre-create the identity user and config so that it's there ahead of time. So an important part of this whole local experience is not just having a stack you can work with, but being able to switch between that stack and the cloud, which you'll see in a minute. And in addition, uh, being able to bootstrap the data, because how many times have you had to set up your local environment with a whole bunch of data just to be productive with the solution? I mean, I go through this even with customers where somebody wanted us to pop in on a project and literally the environment wasn't available in, 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 in the cloud for us to do work because nobody's invested in that local compose up story. But if you had, we could have been up and running in five minutes and then we could be productive and do work. So can't emphasize it enough, super cool. Um, the point is then we have this bootstrap and that's gonna go ahead and run these initialization scripts for Martin and the data and DB in it on the data. And then the rest will be ready for runtime. So for example, if I go over here and we say, let's uh, get into my script here. Uh, so I'll do a start backend, and what that's gonna do is start Kafka, start Redis, you know, start Elk so that I have a logging environment uh, and all of the things that I'm expecting to use with the local code. And then I'm gonna invest in my strategy or provider model or MEF in my code to dynamically sort of you know, choose based on configuration. Are we local or are we cloud, right? So which provider am I using? Um, that's just code, so I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on it, but let's take a quick peek at the solution itself. So what I've got here 
is you know, a solution that has you know, an identity server application. That's a website. It's got you know, a couple apps that communicate with it. It's got a, a configuration runtime. That's the one that goes and gets the data from configuration, that backend. It's got a web app and API for registration of a user, which you'll see. It's got a runtime for users for reading and logging in. And then it's got a domain, right, with messages and things, including, you know, some options for Kafka or Event Hub. So just, you know, obviously I could separate these things. It's just in here that way. Um, and, you know, it's even got an initialization environment. So if we kind of keep going, then you'll see I have these initialization for the data, right? So get it all done, get it all ready. But the end result is that I can now run this and everything works in Visual Studio. I don't have to run it in Docker and Visual Studio. In order to be productive, I actually prefer to just write the code and run it this way against the back end in Docker. And then eventually, if I want, I could you know, uh, do the Compose project in Visual Studio if I wanted to debug. Now, once this is up and running, what that's gonna do is it's going to load up the websites so that I can hit them against the back end. So a couple of these are still loading. And the other thing I wanted to comment on, I mentioned that Docker Compose was something that you could use in Visual Studio. There's a Compose project in there that gives me a YAML for all the files in the solution. I could use that and run it and do debugging, but what I have found more useful and more important, and this is why I do the Elk stack locally and flip to the cloud, I want to debug with my logs. When something goes wrong, that's really powerful, because I'm gonna see stuff that went in the logs and I'm gonna go, what? That's a password, or why is that message there? Or we have an error on our error page, therefore there's really no useful error. Um, so stuff happens, and I think that that's the best way to find it. So I'm gonna open up my registration, and this is the locally running application. And what I'm gonna do is register, so Michelle Busta, uh, live demo at gmail.com. And we'll call it live demo Busta. So let me register myself. And if my database is up and running in the backbones there, then this will work. Um, did I sound nervous about that? I'm not sure. Uh, and so this is actually faking that I get an email. So when I click here, it's actually gonna complete the registration, take me to the pages if I click the link. And now I'm gonna set my password, right? So let's do that. And well, sometimes stuff goes wrong and this kind of blew up, right? So that's okay, I mean, not in production. But what I could do here is localhost uh, 5601 and I can hit my elk stack, right? So now I'm gonna get errors surfaced up there. And we'll go ahead and click error and see what I've got. Looks like something happened. So let's see if I can add the activity ID. So end-to-end -end tracing, yet another interesting thing you can work on tied into your messaging story. So let's go see what this error produces in terms of end to end. And if I'm lucky, I picked the right one. Let's see, somewhere. Uh, password require, requires alphanumeric. So I just found it, right? I mean, probably an easier way to see that would be if I just went ahead and added these two guys. And now we can see the whole end to end trace, also which other parts of the app it hit. And I can see surprising things like, oh, isn't that a useful log? Really? So debug with your logs, just a tip and make sure you have end-to-end -end tracing so you can do this, another tip. And good news is in App Insights, it'll actually do a lot of that for you. It'll just stitch it right in, so that's pretty cool. Now, I've solved my problem, I just need to go fix it over here. So let's go ahead and type a good password. And that will do the reset. And then now I should be able to log in, which means the eventual consistency story of putting that user into the database should have worked. I'll show you that running, and then we'll come back. So we'll do to Michelle Busta Plus uh, live demo. And click it over here. And it looks like I got in, okay? So with that, 
Um, one of the things that I actually had started here, which I guess it didn't hit the breakpoint for, is in my user profile here, I should hit a breakpoint. Um, I probably had already run it, so it didn't run again. But basically, this is the idea of you know, choosing which provider. Obviously, you can do this in a number of ways. It's just a sample, but you want to invest in this. It's not that much work, and then you have the two different providers. So with that, I think I'll leave that message there, and let's look at the cloud, yeah? Um, and I guess one other thing I could emphasize here is that if I run the consumers, which are going to process messages, here is my audit consumer, and if I run that, oops, yeah. I think I ran step into instance, which was you know not necessary, but it'll get there. Okay, so, and this will just show, again, I've obviously got config settings that are telling it go to Kafka, and so it'll start pulling those messages, whatever it was that I just did, and produce those, uh, which should get them to a database, right? So it'll do an insert. So this is just illustrating that output, right? So point being, I don't need you to set up a backbone in the cloud. I can use Docker and all of its goodness locally, get all that stuff done, all good. And now I'm gonna stop this guy, close this app, stop all. You can do it, come on. Apparently didn't get the memo about stop. <laughs> that was a nervous laugh, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think I said yes. Okay, so the reason I wanted to do that is because in uh, this list of things that I have here, I have a stop um, back end and then I have a start all. I'm not gonna wait for it, but the point is you wanna invest in that too. Start all the things, back end, all the apps. Let's see if everything's working with Docker so my DevOps people can get a good experience. So that's the idea. Now let's move over to our environment in the cloud. So I've done all this development, I've invested in a local experience, I've tested swapping that so that it'll work in the cloud. Right now I'm you know, deploying all my containers that are doing the front end web app API. The ones that are writing the events are usually the APIs, right? So these are my Docker containers. My back end that pulls the messages are projectors that are pulling from the messaging backbone in my Docker containers. It looks like I have a bad one, but we'll come back to that. And you know, from in here, I can go to my profile web and I can try to do the same experience and see that everything's working in the cloud. So if I come up and say, Michelle Busta, and we'll call this a live demo EE, and we'll just go ahead and register, and we will complete the registration, and I might as well set my password. So that's all done. And what's happened here is in my resource groups here, we can see I have my uh, Docker Enterprise uh, cluster. So, you know, nothing really to see except for the fact that I am running that cluster. Okay. Uh, second thing is, which looks like my, you know, links expired here. Uh, this is my event hub. So I have an event hub, and you can see I have a number of different, different um, event hubs, but right now I'm hitting swarm. The reason I wanted to show you this, though, is because you might have the concept of a global event hub entry point that then messages replay into the microservice vertical so that you can have a global area for all identity and audit that. Um, the other thing you can do in event hub, which is interesting, is you can turn on capture. And capture will capture, obvious, uh, all the messages and push them out in Avro format to a cold storage, but it will also raise an event to the event grid, so I could pick that up and write it in text messages storage so that I can replay from the beginning of time super fast text messages to rebuild backend read stores. <sighs> so that's a really nice feature of Event Hub, which is why I tend to use that instead of a service bus for this type of thing, because we want to have capture for all messages for all time, and we don't want to maintain it as a Kafka cluster or some other thing. So it's just a beautiful thing. Um, okay, point taken. Next. So the other thing that's back here is I obviously have a Cosmos database. 
Um, and so what I'm gonna do is let's go to that data explorer and let's see what we got. I'll zoom that in a bit. Okay, so in my uh, audit, what I can do is do a new SQL query and I can see, or actually user history, sorry. Let's do that one. And let's see if I've got anything where, uh, first let's see what it looks like at all. So these are my messages that are projected from history and audit. And so I'm gonna look for the email that matches my name. So I'm gonna say where c.email equals, and it was Michelle Busta plus live demo ee at gmail.com. And we'll go ahead and execute that query, but I don't see anything. And the reason I don't see anything, obviously, is because that projector is down. So this is where we get to talk about what happens when things go wrong, right? Projector's down, I need to be alerted about stuff like that, especially if it's mission critical eventual consistency. I also need to maybe monitor the data store when we expect things to write more often and it doesn't, there should be a trigger for that too because what if I don't get notified of the connect of the projector? So stuff like that still becomes important um, and certainly a discussion for a time. And if I go back to my local here and in my Docker EE do a demo PS, what that's gonna do is it's gonna redeploy everything with the correct configuration. So I have a misconfigured something, right? This is my latest state of, of config. And it's gonna go ahead and update all those services. And while it's doing that, I'm gonna head over and look at my other you know, projector, which is the audit projector. So my audit projector also has a query. And it should have received messages, hopefully, if I've done anything interesting in the website, right? So let's say uh, in my, you know, website, what I'm gonna do is go to identity, and I'm gonna to try to log in. So I'm gonna go Michelle Busta at plus live demo ee at gmail.com, and we're gonna do a bath password. And we're gonna do that a couple times. And we're probably gonna get locked out, because that's what happens. And so, let's see what happens if I do one more, and then I head over to audit, and I collect where email, or sorry, username, c.username equals Michelle Busta dot plus live demo ee at gmail.com. And we'll give it a run. It looks like it found me. So what we're gonna do is since not everybody has a username, not all the messages have a username, but what I really care about is the ID. So I'm gonna say select C dot underscore underscore message type from C where we've got subject ID, which will be in every message equals that. And you see user login failed, 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 lockout, et cetera, okay? Now, if my deployment has completed, then I should also be able to go back here, see the result, and it's there. So history will have other messages as well related to user registered, signed up, et cetera. And that's sort of how the architecture and the moving parts works. Those are the things I'm managing in the deployed cluster um, that obviously have other things we can discuss about, right? So, um, that's, that, the demo's worked, that's awesome, okay. Uh, do I sound surprised? Hey. <laughs> Cause you know, 40 minutes people, okay, I'm just gonna throw that out there. Um, and didn't practice at all. So, uh, so one of the things that's interesting too when you look at the micro level is remember, when you're trying to manage all of this stuff, once you've found your business capabilities, get a team around this stack this domain, and now you're dealing with what's the API service, what are those messages, they only ever come in one domain, uh, what is the topic it will go to that's the microservice topic, even if there's an overarching global, uh, what are the projectors we need there for, one projector, are we doing any CQRS views to pull messages from other places, and then the data, and that replays over and over and over. So it starts to feel more manageable, and it really gives you that business value. Audit and history are just one couple of pieces, right? Um, is this a lot of work? Yeah, it is. But here's the thing, coding is hard. 
And everything you do that's worth value takes time and effort, right? I try to make it as micro as possible. You have to have a good business reason to do this. Think back to dollars, revenue, the visibility into the system, the visibility into business operations. I didn't even touch on workflows, like the fact that some companies don't understand why something happened over here and it didn't reach this part of the business unit yet. And you can take those messages and when you have time, emphasis on when, not if, you will go back to those messages and build new projections that start showing the business, hey, this thing started over here, but usually by tomorrow, the message hits here and we do this other thing, so our state for that workflow is off. How powerful is that if you have the messages already? And all you had to do is think about events that happened in your system on the micro level. That's all, people, no. So it has to work. You have to test it. Projectors could get poison messages. You have to be prepared. And here's the thing you're gonna just hate me for before you go, if it's not the fact that I might be over three minutes. Uh, I gotta tell you, it's no longer the ops people that have the pager, right? If something fails in production on Friday night, and it's the weekend, and it's a poison message, and the projector doesn't know how to handle that message, your domain, your capability domain for microservice is not just ops has to handle it, it's the dev team, it's the test team, it's the knowledge across all of those teams of the expected behavior because the dev is gonna look at the logs and know more than the ops guys will until things happen and you practice. But the other thing about making it work is you should do drills first, right? You have to try to make your system fail. You have to think about these things in advance, and you will achieve it if you do that. So no pain, no gain is all I have to say, and I'm gonna leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs>